All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayyid from drbean.com. Welcome to one more show. This is the second one for today. My favorite part, chit chats. Um, my apologies, I took some time. Luffy, um, sometimes when he wants to drink water, he will not drink it until you stand with him. So <laughs> he was there and, and calling me. So I went there and he took his sweet time drinking water and kept making sure that I was there. So he just finished and I came back. Okay, so how is everything? Um, was this previous one hour of any use or did I <laughs> just take an hour away from you? I thought it was important for us to look at the facts instead of getting stuck in what I really hope that, at least with the cool beans, what we don't end up is with the rumors or myths that when we, uh, if we iterate, then the overall points that we make would become weaker. So Barbara says it was excellent. Thank you very much. And Barbara, how is Lotus? Truth Seeker says really good review. Dr. Bean, thank you very much. Please do me a favor, please share it. Uh, hopefully in a few minutes, Odyssey would have pulled it over as well. So if it goes down here, it would have been uh, taken up there. <laughs> Laurie says, you, you're so right. Yes, he. I don't know where he is, but he had to make sure that I'm standing when he was drinking water. Arun is here after a long time. Most of the antiviral medicines won't work after some days as viruses become resistant very fast after so many mutations of SARS-CoV-2. Will any excess sphere? So good news is this, that you may have noticed after Delta, there has been no other variant that could become dominant. And I think that we are actually getting out of pandemic at this time. So I think there is going to be no variant that is going to take over Delta, and then with the mass people who are vaccinated, people who became infected and recovered, there is just less left for this. And I think those who are left, most of them are healthier and children. So it has less to, it has less places to go to. And Delta is not letting any other variant come up, which is a good thing for us because we are becoming uh, we are understanding how to work with Delta. John Titer, have you seen the recent preprint regarding persistent microclotting in COVID long haulers? No, but uh, I would look at that. And I today I had a discussion with a doctor here who's in New York about long haulers. He has very successfully been um, managing long haulers especially the one with the neurological symptoms. He is going to appear with me on FLCCC weekly update next week. I believe it's on 13th. It's next Wednesday, I guess. Yeah, on 13th. And then we both are going to discuss the long haulers and he had some great ideas. So we'll, we'll offer some more insights then. Trillium says it was a great comparison. So we have an idea of how things are progressing. Absolutely. Thank you. Barbara is saying she's behaving now. So Lotus. <laughs> so here Kyrie is sitting over there grooming herself. And Luffy was uh, upstairs, wanted to drink water with me. Siddhartha is here after a long time. Hello, Siddhartha. How are you? Texas is ex excellent expenditure of my time. Thank you very much, Texas. Thank you very much for all your help and participation as well for keeping this place good. Um, Doug says, lack of sleep takes a toll on my cognition. Sorry about that. Talking about lack of sleep, this pain in my neck and the back was so bad yesterday, last night. I could not sleep well. Fortunately, what I did was I just took painkillers today to continue to work. Marcus says, excellent talk. Thank you very much.
Siddhartha, we are all good. How about you? It's a long time no see. So, okay to let go. I, dis I decide every day to talk about it. And I every day talk about something else. So, I have it on my radar. Good to know. Grace says, love, love that comparison chart. How can we get it? So I have that on my uh, PowerPoint. Maybe I can make a PDF and po post it somewhere where you can download it. So, so far it's with me. Maybe I can convert it into a PDF and upload it on Discord. Texas and other YouTube and Discord moderators, administrators, what do you think? Should we do that? So Eileen Glazer says, how do we access your Odyssey? So basically go to odyssey.com and then look for Dr. Bean and you can access it. Let me show you very quickly. Um, if I share my screen and then OBS is a, so here, if you go to Odyssey, <clears throat> and just look for Dr. Bean. I think that would bring me up. Look, here I am, Dr. Bean Sayed. So what they are doing, which I'm really grateful for, is that every day they automatically pull the talks that get recorded. So for example, today's talk in another hour or so will have automatically appear on Odyssey. Look at this, yesterday's talks are all there as well. Look at me posing personalized medical education. <laughs> so, so that is how. Texas is always hungry for being PDF. So maybe I should do that. I'll do that, Texas. So folks, I will convert the PowerPoint into a PDF and upload that on, on Discord. Eileen says, thank you for the Odyssey tutorial. Did you ice your neck? No, I did not. Maybe I should. Yes, I, I should do that. Uh, the tennis ball. Yeah. It was really bad last night. I could not sleep well. So SG Joe says, or show it on screen and we can take pics. I can show it again. Um, it is part of that uh, discussion as well. Uh, let me see if I can open it up. So if I go here and open it up, make a presentation, then go to OBS, 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 where is OBS, and then save full screen so do you see it here here hopefully you can see it if I remove this and now let's see if I can did you like this cartoon I only had the stamina to draw just this one thing so here is a mom standing saying my baby will fight you and then there's another baby who's saying, look, mom, I can fight too. So this is the one characteristics. So let me know. I'm going to stay on each. <laughs> Barbara says the cartoon is so creative. So I'm going to stay on each one of these for a few seconds and then go to the next one. This is the next one. I would have loved to see the breakdown of these 775 people in phase two part and three part and how did they, you know, 
structure them and in various centers, which country had how many people there. That will be interesting to see. Margaret says, love the drawing. Thank you very much, Margaret. And welcome. So here is the next one. Lonnie says, my husband uses successfully energetic patches. Yes, so I think I, I should use them. Uh, this last one is, let me see if I can move my picture away. Last one is price. Then next, and I did not put all the information because it is a lot more. For example, the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, how long one stays, how long the other one, and so on. But I thought that was not the part. So hopefully, so then <laughs> this is it. Okay, so I hope that that is useful. <clears throat> so Sasha says, can you give links to the peer reviewed studies? So I am suspecting you're talking about the ivermectin. So if you go to, let me actually take this one down first. So if you go to here, ivmmeta.com. In here, they have various classifications, all studies 65, peer reviewed 45, randomized control 32, and they have done meta analysis of them. If you see in the discussion today, I did not use a meta analysis. I just used one study that is comparable to, let's say, molnupiravir trial, and that should be sufficient. It's a good study. And I showed you that how there are drugs that are approved by one study, not even that one phase three study, it's two and three combined and with a small number of people in it. But here, um, if you see various studies, you can go into them and you can see how it is. If you see here, study, it's discussion, it's source, PDF, DOI. Here is Luffy. Improvement. Luffy, what happened? What? You've already taken your water. The kind of uh, improvement, hospitalization, treatment and control, zero over 62 or 56 dose. So they, and plus here is the tree where you can look at this, for example, this one is red. So that means it did not show good results, actually showed negative results because it, one, it crossed the boundary, secondly, it went to the other side a lot and then all of those green that are on this side and their uh, whiskers are not crossing this identity these are good studies so here this is a good study um this is a good study this is a good study this is a good one this is a good one these all are good uh this is good same here so eventually you just need one good study and that is here. You don't have to go for, let's go figure out one more. At least if we compare it to the way, let's say molnupiravir is being looked at. Molnupiravir is being looked at even before the trial results were out. Jody is saying that you may have strep, Dr. Mina, got neck and back muscle aches. That may be possible. I had some sore throat a few days ago. Okay, let's see. <clears throat> Eileen says, excellent, took photos. This is the data that I could collect from these studies. You could actually just open up these two pages and look at the data and kind of compare them as well. I just had to do that homework for cool beans today.
Rizobit says, I heard they can change many factors in new drug studies and they can toss out studies. Absolutely. So there are so many ways that statistics can be manipulated and can be played with. Um, if, if you look again, I will give this disclaimer first. Malipiravir seems to be a good drug. And even with the 50% efficacy from hospitalization and zero death, I would take it. It's good. But if you look at this drug, started with government's funding, that means there was already a roadmap for it to get to the approval state. In June, it gets order, $1.2 billion promise. I, I don't know if it was in MOU or if it was a payment, but there was no result yet. Again, it was conditional, but still, can we say, hey, I'm going to give you $1.2 billion. Can the government tell us that I'm going to give you $1.2 billion and go make a study of 700 people with avermectin and if shows results, that $1.2 billion is yours. <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. We will keep calling it a horse paste and make fun of everyone who talks about it. Um, high dose says, do you think the vaccine will have new unexpected side effects years from now? At least in the vaccine, I have not seen anything that should do that. For example, look, COVID can cause early diabetes if it causes damage to pancreas. And that damage can reduce the number of islet cells in the pancreas or beta cells and so that means as the cells continue to decrease anyways during the age aging process, a person may become diabetic earlier. That kind of a thing I'm not seeing with the vaccine. The concept that somehow vaccine is going to go and mutate a DNA and modify it, and then that would at a later stage become a problem that just the whole concept is wrong. Yes, so Robin, you're correct. And I intentionally did not want to use the meta-analysis because for Malipiravir, there is no meta-analysis. And for Remdesivir, there is a meta-analysis that says Remdesivir doesn't work and it is still authorized. For Malipiravir, for Bamdanivimab, there is a small phase two and three study. It's not even a complete full 700 people phase three. At least I don't have the data to show that. It is phase two and three. It's a small study. Or trial, and if that can be afforded an approval, what's wrong with this Mahmood study? That's comparable. I don't have to go to 65 studies meta analysis. On the other hand, if you think about it this way, that hey, the um, the Malipiravir 170 sites, multiple countries different socioeconomic statuses probably, different geographical situations, different foods, different environments, different weather. So imagine every one of them is a smaller study in itself. Then that is a huge meta-analysis of these studies made up of totally 700 people, 775 or something. On the other hand, if you look at ivermectin, that is thousands and thousands of people. So again, we all know that uh, um making sense of something that already makes sense, but it is not going to be looked at. That's It's going to keep getting hammered and insulted. But at least it is in front of our eyes how these things are panning out. <laughs> so Art Patron is saying there's 700 million to buy a few of Hunter's artist paintings. Can they buy some of my paintings as well? So Anthony has a good question. Does mouthwash also kill monocytes and macrophages in my cheek and sinus when gargled? Depends upon the length of time that the mouthwash is there. Secondly, the amount of time it is exposed to the cell membranes and can it actually pull uh, fluids out of them? If so, then yes, it can. But again, mouthwashes are calibrated in a way that it doesn't cause too much hurt. Otherwise, every time we use it, we'll end up with the ulcers in our mouth. If it can kill a macrophage, then it can kill the cells of the cheek and 
a nasopharyngeal area. Uh, Lissu says, um, Finn Bean, Dr. Corey described COVID as organizing pneumonia. Does Pneumovax 23 lessen the impact on lungs if a person gets COVID? No. So the organizing pneumonia's basic concept is the following. Let me see if I can... The basic concept, it has nothing to do with the streptococcus. Let's say this is our airway. And the airway divides and divides until it continues to become smaller. And finally, it reaches a point after many divisions that we have these very thin walled balloon-like spaces, which are the alveolar sacs. And then inside them, if I just take one alveolus, let's say here, this is one alveolus, one unit, functional unit. The pneumonia simply means that there is congestion and infection here. What happens is as part of pneumonia, when the infection occurs viral or bacterial, usually viral infections are outside of the alveoli it's in the interstitium that is a connective tissue and we call it walking pneumonia or interstitial pneumonia because gas exchange continues to happen. The person doesn't really feel, doesn't have cough that much, doesn't have phlegm. So they, are, they think they're okay and they're fine and they're walking around. But if you take the chest x-ray, you would see these uh, signs of pneumonia. And this is why it is called walking pneumonia or interstitial pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonia are usually inside. So there, the issue is usually inside. The bacteria is in the alveolus. It destroys the cells there. It fights with the immune cells here as well. And so there is a lot of debris and the fluids and everything. And that can actually appear as yellow or black or green phlegm. And there is irritation of the airway and that causes cough and then fever and all that. Once this pneumonia occurs, then there is a progression from here to say what's going to happen to this place now that is damaged. So there is a possibility of resolution. Resolution. So for the medicos here, you know that there is a concept, concept of hepatization, right? So what happens is that this little uh, congestion that has occurred it's going to become the red blood cells are going to start breaking down and it's going to change its shape and it is going to look like a cake or liver. That is what we say, hepatization. So there is a, a red hepatization and then the gray hepatization. And then finally, this now for everyone, this little uh, debris here that is present, there are two outcomes of this. One is it is going to be resolved, resolution occurs. That means macrophages and other garbage picking cells, monocytes, dendritic cell, they will start eating away these things just as I'm, I'm now eating this away with my marker. And finally, they would just clear this and restore the normal structures. So this is like a place where there was a party in the evening and when you woke up in the morning, there are trash everywhere. And then you clean that up. So that is called resolution. And tissue goes back to normal. But if the resolution does not occur, then what would happen is this area will become organized. Organized mean that this trash is not picked up. And not only it is not picked up, it actually becomes fibrosed, just like other scars on our body, they become fibrous, they get clot in there, and then that clot organizes into tissue-like structure. So imagine this whole area here becomes a big scar. And this is all now tissue because there is collagen and there is fibrin and there are other things that have appeared here. Now this functional part is permanently gone. It's not going to work ever again. With some 
rehabilitation, you can kind of unstick some of these, but most of this time, this is gone. This is called organization. This is called organized pneumonia. It has huge impact. One, the functional tissue is gone. Secondly, there is the scar formation that is going to pull all the lungs and it's going to reduce the lungs volume that is called the baby lung syndrome. And now the patient is going to end up with smaller lungs, less functional lungs, and he can have a problem for the rest of their life. So this is what organi so organizing pneumonia has nothing to do with um, bacteria. Of course, bacteria can have supra infections too. But from Corey's context, that is what he was talking about. <laughs> Tool Fogger says, Dr. Bean's artistic ability has been captivated always. Thank you very much. Um, so Guy Telfer says, is granzymes and perforins phlegm? So phlegm, that yellowish or blackish or greenish thing that comes out, it has many things in it. So if we look at this structure once more, if there is normally streptococcal, for example, streptococcus and the neutrophils are breaking down, then yellowish color would appear. So that, that phlegm would contain broken red blood cells, broken bacteria, uh, neutrophils broken, macrophages dead, um, local tissue dead, the pneumocytes. Pneumocytes are the cells of the alveoli the lining of the alveoli, these pneumocytes are of course broken down. And so all of them, broken tissue, blood has spilled in here, broken RBC, blood proteins, all of that together is phlegm. Phlegm can be black if there is too much necrosis going on. Necrosis means tissue death is occurring then the necrosed tissue, the dead cells appear black. So that can be a black phlegm. And that is an indication of uh, damage that is causing death of the tissue. And then it can be green for some uh, bacteria. They give a greenish color to uh, phlegm. So it can be green. And then, of course, blood can be there. Hemoptysis can occur. There could be blood coming from the lungs as well, for example, in tuberculosis, in, in cancers, in other uh, fungal injuries and so on, or, or bleedings because of vascular issues. Um, Dr. B, can O blood type take monoclonal? Yes. The blood type O has a tendency to bleed because the factor eight is either genetically defective or less in quantity, but that has nothing to do with the antibodies. So, Wanda says, thank you for your uh, much as you do. My doc recommended after instead of vaccine. I need to go to the dentist, but I'm still very concerned. Any input? Is it safe? So you, your doctor must have some reason to say this. It may be allergies or some other reason. I can tell you this. I did not go to a dentist when I was not vaccinated. I was just too um, concerned. Although dentists are nowadays, they're very, very careful. They clean a lot. They clean the instruments. They clean their hands. They, they're wearing a mask. They use the gloves. But still, I get very nervous. And after the vaccine, I have gone once, and I now have to go once more. So this is how I feel. So eventually, let's say if you don't want to take a vaccine, or you can't take a vaccine then you have to eventually go to a doctor, a dentist. But it scares me. Yep. So they have a lot of uh, preparation nowadays. 
So, Diane, I see your question before as well. I cannot offer a personal advice like this. Um, I had the first vaccine, then had COVID. Should I get the second vaccine? I'll tell you, I was speaking with one of my friends today who said that they had COVID. And they were asking me, he said, so is this, is that vaccine or not? And I said, yeah, that is eventually what are you taking a vaccine for you're taking a vaccine to handle covid and so if you handled covid that's like somebody who's sleeping you wake them up and say please take your sleeping med well they are already sleeping so if somebody has already taken care of covid in a healthy normal way without risking their life in you know hospital then uh, the body has proven that it can handle the virus. Again, talk with your doctor to see what is the right thing for you. But generally, yeah, that is a... Uh, if it makes you feel better, then please take the vaccine. It should be okay. Nipa says we have air purifier. So Nipa, you are a dentist. So Nipa, what is the situation? Do you get a lot of patients who are not vaccinated or if so do you do anything differently so nipa says we have hepa filters very good we have uvc sterilization yep and dentists have to be i mean for their own sake you have to be very careful because you're going to be working with patient's mouth. Julia says, my cousin is a dentist. She had to pay for some remodeling and do the negative pressure setups, which is excellent. I mean, not that she had to pay for it, but excellent for the patients. Barbara says, I'm still afraid to go to a dermatologist and need to go. I unfortunately have my father's white skin and lots of little things that should be removed soon. Hmm. Good luck, stay safe. Nipa says, don't worry. So I hope you're talking about someone who was saying, can I go to the dentist? Jay Aze says, from a mechanism analysis, could molnupiravir, if also used with Regeneron, lessen the efficacy of the Regeneron treatment? Okay, let me, let me draw it out. But with the Regeneron, I actually think the pandemic is actually just this simple to manage. IV or Molnu together maybe, and Regeneron. Regeneron has always shown good effect. You saw that with Trump, you saw that with Giuliani, you saw that with many, many people. And I think Regeneron should just be the standard of care. So now, question about Malupiravir and Regeneron. It almost seems like I talk about IV as I used to before. Now I can talk it in a different label, although the functions are not entirely the same. So let's say um, here is the here is a cell, and then let's make make some eyes for this cell, and then let's say we have Malupiravir. Malnupiravir is sitting inside, right? And so it is going to sit here. And if the virus appears inside, then the Malnupiravir is going to disrupt the RDRP. So newer viruses formation will be less and the number will be less, load will be less and so on. Meanwhile, there will be viruses outside there will be viruses coming out from here as well, but the number is less. Now, if you have Regeneron, that is going to attack them from outside, the ones that are outside. It can. This is why Regeneron folks says that, hey, it may reduce your ability to fight the infection in the future. It is not that it goes and destroys some cell. What they mean is that because Regeneron is going to mop up the virus and take it away very fast, your immune system would have exposure to lesser load. So it won't get enough training and maybe not enough number of memory cells and so on. So when the future virus appears, 
Now imagine that this is a person who could not handle it without the Regeneron and Molnupiravir or IV. Then in the future, if they don't take Regeneron and their body cannot make correct number of antibodies fast enough, then they would have a problem. So this is what they say. But generally immune system will get trained. It will be less trained because the viral load will be less. And so the more drugs you take, let's say you take IV, you take Molnu, and you take uh, Regeneron. So all of them are going to reduce the immune system's capability for training. And that would mean lesser preparation. Uh -huh. Good question, though. Soma says, going to miss Dr. Bean talks as busy preparing for a medical entrance exam. We'll join Dr. Bean after clearing it successfully. So uh, good luck. And Soma, is it in, uh, where is it? The clearance exam. Good luck and um, yes, tell us where it is. So Nipa says, we had to work nonstop, had to take care of our patients with all precautions. Excellent. <laughs> Zen, and I can understand, I mean, the dentist, out of all the kind of doctors, they're going to be the most exposed because they're directly working with the mouth, which could have infection. Uh, Luffy's mewing reminds me of my sister's cat. Very similar voice, but my sister's cat always mews in two syllables, never one. <laughs> yeah, Luffy is just... Luffy, uh, you have never seen him arguing with my wife. So they both actually talk with her. She would say something and then they would mew and then she would say something. It's kind of fun to see them talk. A Cook says, can asymptomatic people with COVID-19 transfer the virus? And if so, is the same amount of virus that gets transferred to another person? In theory, yes. So let's put asymptomatic in two groups. Those who are asymptomatic because the load is less. And that may be because they were vaccinated or had COVID before or they had COVID and their antibodies are there and the load could not develop. So in such case, they would not shed too much. But if there are those asymptomatic who handle it asymptomatically, they may have a higher load, but again, not as high as those who become symptomatic because what is the reason for becoming symptomatic? The people who are symptomatic, they are symptomatic because the virus, so let's say this is the mouth area. So let's say this is the tongue. Nipa, please don't mind me drawing um, <laughs> teeth like this. <laughs> Nipa is going to send me some sort of a fine to say teeth are not like this. So let's say here is the, so this is the mouth area. There are some teeth here as well. There's this little thing. Okay, so if the viral load in the mouth area becomes on the surfaces of the mouth becomes so high and it's not in the teeth so imagine it's not in the teeth it's behind the teeth it's on the teeth too so if it becomes so high so great that it breaks the the cells and it breaks enough number of cells then the symptoms would appear so symptoms are nothing but destroyed cells which are causing us to cough and be to have painful throat and the nose and then as the virus spreads to the other parts of the body and causes damage, symptoms would appear. So if there are no symptoms, that doesn't mean the damage is occurring in the same way and we just don't feel it. That simply means damage is not occurring with the same uh, intensity. That means the viral load is not great enough. Or even if the virus number is more, immune system is not letting the virus get into the cells with that much of a quantity. So that would mean the shedding will be less from asymptomatic, not as much as somebody who has symptoms. 
Good question. Yes, yeah, so um, Texas Max says, Discord link has expired. Please change. OK, so I will um, create a permanent link and share. Thank you, Texas. So Bonzo says, if someone with CCR5 Delta 32 mutation likely to have a stronger, weaker response to COVID vaccine. So let's see. Um, Texas was talking about this as well. So CCR5 Delta 32. So the... The question, what I need to see is that if the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation causes the helper T cells to not function correctly, then or be lesser in number, then we have a problem that the immune system would not respond correctly. So why don't you give me a couple of days let me write it down as an action item like i have <laughs> 20000 other uh, uh, things that i've written just one second i'm just going to take it and let me actually so i have synthyride written natural immunities 12 time from israel that some other studies and I'm gonna put CCR by Delta 32 mutation. I'll discuss that. Please uh, give me a day or so. So Wanda said, will Novavax be available soon? So I had that discussion a few days ago that Novavax has gotten one win and that is that Everybody who was participant in their trial and who was not given placebo but had Novavax, they have been um, recognized as fully vaccinated. So that is a big deal. Now they're preparing for the EUA as well. So I think they would get it if their participants are fully vaccinated, recognized. Now, when would they get it? I don't know. I thought it should be early, but they have been late for a long time. So um, <clears throat> there's a question about taking ivermectin if still not feeling well past day 12. I don't think it is needed, but for my own, when I don't feel well, I just take it and I continue to take it until I feel better. Nipa is saying that I can install industrial room suction to circulate the air inside the HEPA filters, air purifiers are very good, very good. So, <clears throat> Mr. George says, girlfriend got j and any suggestion to help her through any possible upcoming symptoms? So, my wife had j and J. I I was giving her and she still developed symptoms which continued on, I think it's hardly two or three weeks ago that she has become much better. Otherwise she would almost, in the beginning, she would say day, night, that hey, I have symptoms. And then it became two or three apart, two or three days apart then weekly and so on. I was giving her lots of things, many over-the-counter things, aspirins and Allegra's and Advil's and um, so many others. She still developed joint pains and 
muscle aches and she was very sleepy for very many months. I have not seen this kind of, this intensity of side effects for everyone who takes JNJ. So it is very few people who do that. So these are the over-the-counter things can be useful. Again, not a medical advice. I cannot give you an advice. Um, talk with the doctor as well. I'm just talking about what I did uh, when my wife had it. So Loretta, you're, you are correct. And she almost two or three weeks ago. So this was in May, I believe that she had the, uh, or even before May, May, June, July, August, September, October, six months later. And she was preparing for the booster for Johnson & Johnson. Soma says, uh, so that is the message we saw before as well. Jay Azi says, do you have such a wealth of information and create excellent content. Have you considered going to locals to reach more people on an uncensored platform? I have not uh, gone to locals, uh, but I'm trying to go to Odyssey and so on. I would try locals to Well, so um, Spartacus, Spartacus now says, in Canada today, no longer allowed to travel on planes, trains inside the country anywhere. Really? My brother is in Canada. I didn't hear this from him. Maybe. Is it because of the COVID? So David says, can an individual that has recovered from COVID-19 and has been vaccinated donate convalescent plasma? Interesting that they don't accept convalescent plasma from those who are vaccinated. The difference is that the, the uh, diversity of antibodies is not as great as with the natural infection but it should be sufficient enough as well. It is going to be less type. So maybe that because of that, they don't accept it. So Michael Korean says, some question, same question as above, really wanting to find evidence of vaccinated people shedding less virus, being less contagious. I'm sure you've discussed it before. Love your work, Dr. Bean. Thank you very much. So this is an area for which finding evidence is difficult or finding um, studies is difficult. And here is why. Imagine I am vaccinated. Now, how long would you follow me and see the people around me get you know, if I first I get infected, then how many people do I make infected? So that is a difficult thing to track. And because of that, they don't really have a lot of, lots of studies in that. We can talk in terms of mechanism. And that is, as I said before, in terms of mechanism, because a vaccinated person or a previously infected and recovered person will not be... Uh, will not have a higher severity of the disease. And we know that there are people who would have higher severity and who would even die. I'm talking about general, less at risk folks with less uh, severe comorbidities. They will handle the virus much quicker within a couple of days. And because of that, even if they develop symptoms, it would be for a shorter period of time. And so lesser load will, lesser duration will be there. 
when they become symptomatic and if they shed when they are symptomatic then their load would be the same as unvaccinated why because they're symptomatic that means there is enough load to cause damage that means a similar thing as if somebody is unvaccinated and so then they would shed the same load Tool Fogger says, this is an excellent question. I hope the answer was excellent as well. <laughs> so uh, Cool Tune says, Made Easy says, close friend of mine is post-COVID sick all the time, um, fatigue, unable to work. So please check out I Recover protocol on uh, FLCCC and see if some doctor can help them with that. Bob Thresher, yes, so in theory, yes. I don't have any study to back up, but from a mechanism point of view, in theory, yes. I haven't seen that. If this was actually happening, then we would have seen some study. M MSNBC says, your guest last night thought ivermectin didn't work with Delta. What do you think about his statement? So we know, number one, ivermectin doesn't have 100% efficacy. So it is possible that in some people it would not work or it would work less. Number two, that was a one person. Number three, uh, I haven't seen this kind of a situation. looking for questions. Jack says, starting Mirav Rock next week, prayers appreciated. Absolutely. And uh, if you're working with Dr. Bruce Patterson's group, they're very, very careful and they are very, very successful with that as well. So uh, praying for your safety and I think you'll be okay. Brian K says, where can I find the absolute risk reduction numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm for each vaccine? You can actually just calculate them. I have calculated them in my past um, discussions. I'll give you an example. Let's say if I share my screen, I have to go to OBS to share my screen. Okay, so here is how this works. Let's say, some vaccine, some drug has, let's use Moderna, for example. Moderna phase three trial results. Can you imagine Moderna became multi-billionaires overnight with this so if i go to moderna so <clears throat> I actually had, it is so funny that you bring it up. Let me see if I can. The My presentation to Pakistan Medical Association, I actually talked exactly risk reductions in there, absolute risk reduction relative examples, and I used uh, Moderna in there as well. This is a very common question asked. So here. So 
So look at this. <clears throat> this is the vaccine efficacy and they're saying 94.1%. And I was just this weekend, I was explaining it and I had this working example uh, in my uh, presentation. So let me just quickly do a high level discussion of it. Let's see if I can find my board. So <clears throat> I'm going to take numbers from Moderna site. So here they are saying 185 out of 14,073. So they're saying in the placebo, there were 185 people who got infected out of 14,073, correct? So this is placebo. Out of the vaccinated, 11 out of 14,134. So 11 people got infected out of 14,134. Good. This is the basic data. We can actually calculate other things from here. So this is placebo. This is um, vaccine. So let's start one by one. And again, high level, I'm not going to go too much in detail, but I'm going to give an idea of how this is calculated. The first question, let's say risk reduction, we say, what is the absolute risk reduction? So the absolute risk reduction is really a reduction in percentages. So first we take the percentage of this and the percentage of this. So let's say, um, Alexa, what is 18,500 divided by 14,073? 18,500 divided by 14,073 is approximately 1.3146. So let's say 1.32%. So the normal risk of getting infected, according to this data, is 1.3%. Out of every 100 people, 1.3 people will become sick will catch infection and of course you know that this would change it would depend upon the community it would depend upon how people are behaving there what is the viral load there what is the hot spot and there are so many factors but again we are just going with this data whatever were the factors it was their job to figure out that factors were as similar as possible and now let's say this was the result 1.32 percent on the other side Alexa, what is 1100 divided by 14,134? 1100 divided by 14,134 is approximately 0 0.0778. So let's round it up to say 0.08%. Correct? So this, these two numbers, 0.08% and 1.32%, are the percentages what we are saying is, forget about risk reduction and everything. What we are saying is, if somebody is not vaccinated, if a group is not vaccinated, in that group, the infections incidence is 1.32%. Good. And all those qualifiers at various communities, depending upon the how hot spot it is, what kind of community, what kind of socioeconomic status, how they're behaving, mask, not mask. So all those factors are part of it. So I can't go into those. Let's just use these numbers. So we are saying 1.32% in a person who's not vaccinated in a community. If the community is vaccinated, then 0.08%, right? So now we make two groups, one group A, other group B you figure out how many people, let's say in both areas, there are 1,000 people. 1,000, 1,000. 
thousand unvaccinated and thousand vaccinated data coming from this trial that would mean 100 sorry 13 people will become infected out of these thousand and on the other side 0.08 percent so that would almost be uh, 0 0.08 is it 8 no 0 0.8 Alexa, what is 0 0.08 multiplied with 1,000? 0 0.08 times 1,000 is 80. That's not correct. So it is, let's call it 0.1% for our case. So out of, so out of 1,000, this would be 1%. So in, in our case, actually less than 1, it's 0 0.08. Alexa was wrong, I'm, I'm correct. Alexa, you were wrong. Okay, so... Thanks for telling me. <laughs> you're very welcome. So, 1%. Correct. Here, 13. You know that this number is not exactly correct. But again, this is the... Now, when we talk about re absolute risk reduction, what we say is this. We say, in a percentage of people, 100 there was a 1.32% risk. And after the vaccine, the risk went down to 0.08%. So what is the reduction that occurred? Again, percentage. What is the reduction of percentage that occurred because we gave a vaccine? So that, or any intervention, this happens with the other drugs too. We want to know this. That is very simple. What you do is you take 0 0.08 and you subtract that from 1.32 and that would tell you the absolute risk reduction. What you do is, Alexa, <laughs> Alexa, what is 1.32 minus 0 0.08? 1.32 minus 0 0.08 is 1.24. 1.24. So this is 1.24% risk reduction. This is where people uh, there was a doctor i believe from florida he wrote this article which created this rumor and myth that somehow the actual efficacy is just 1.24 percent but that is not the case what is the actual amount of change we'll see that in a second but what is the change? If you have 100 people, then out of them, 1.32% or 1.32 will become sick. But if you've given a vaccine, then 0 0.08 will become sick. So 1.24 people will be saved. Now, if you wanted to say, okay, tell me, how many people should be in this group vaccinated to save one person? Then what you do is here, this is 0 0.08. And then you see to make it one, how many chunks of hundreds are needed. So if there are 10 hundreds, that will become 0 0.8, almost one. So you would need 1,000 people vaccinated to save one. So that is number needed to treat. But important thing is this is 1.24% absolute reduction. Now, if the question then becomes, okay, this is 1.24% reduction and somebody says, well, that's a very tiny percent reduction. No, what we are saying is from 1.32%, it went down to 0.08%. The absolute number reduced is 1.2 per 100. What is, the, what is the size of that? If we wanted to see the size, we divide them. So what we do is we do risk reduction, risk reduction, and then we do relative risk. The, the one that we are seeing is absolute relative risk reduction. Relative risk reduction is 1 minus risk reduction. And the risk reduction is we divide them. So here what we do is we say 
1 minus 0 0.08 divided by, I think it is 1.32. Alexa, what is 1.32 divided by 0 0.08? 1.32 divided by 0 0.08 is 16.5. And what is, Alexa, what is 0 0.08 divided by 1.32? 0 0.08 divided by 1.32 is approximately 0 0.0606. This is the number. So this is 0 0.06. Now, if you subtract that from 1 minus 0 0.06, that becomes 94 point something. This, if you convert that into percentage, this is 94%. What does this mean? This means giving the vaccine would improve the efficacy, would bring the efficacy to 94%. What that means is that there were going to be 1.32 people sick. Now there are only 0 0.08, and that number is 95% better. And this is another way to check, and that is if both numbers were the same, the number 0 0.08 and 1.32, if they were the same, if they both were 1.32, then you'll say there is no, no difference, and the answer is 1. So if the answer is 1, that means when you subtract it from 1, it's 0, that means no effect of the intervention. If the answer becomes lesser than 1, that means in terms of efficacy, 95 and so on, or 60%, then you are getting better results. If the answer becomes more than one, then you are getting worse results. Intervention is actually hurting. So this is how I just did a very quick math of NTTs and absolute risk reduction, relative risk, and, and the uh, those things. I hope that answers the question, Brian. Sorry. Just did a quick bunch of math with Alexa. <laughs> Jan Janet, that's not fair. I use Alexa for my work. She's going to be counting forever. <laughs> Okay, so a freaking American says, I understand that once you have antibodies to alpha B cell somatic hypermutation can anticipate and produce antibodies to the possible variants. Is this occurring with COVID or not? So first, your basic concept is incorrect. And then of course, the second part of the question would become incorrect as well. So hypersomatic hypermutation. Somatic hypermutation is this, is this. So here is a cell, B cell. It happens with the B cells, T cell. I'll explain what is the what, what is it. So here is a B cell. When a daughter B cell is formed, here is a daughter B cell. From the stem cell, not from an, another B cell. Because when a B cell daughter is formed from a parent B mature cell, that is the proliferation, then there is no concept of somatic hypermutation. Then there is the only concept of affinity maturation. There is no somatic hypermutation that would occur. Somatic hypermutation only occurs when new B cells from the stem cells are formed and every B cell is going to take up, is asked to say, you decide who you're going to bind with. And the B cell says, fine, I'm going to rearrange my brain in a way to bind with something else. So let's say this parent stem cell, stem cell I'm saying, is, and these are mostly in the bone marrow. This parent stem cell is able to give rise to a B cell here that can bind with something that has a shape like this. Let's say this is the binding area. Right? Now the same stem cell, when it would give rise to another type of B cell, remember the definition of a stem cell is a cell that can regenerate cells of its own kind, and then it can become, you know, differentiated into other kind. 
So when this cell regenerates its own kind and then they make more daughter cells, let's say this new daughter cell is now able to bind with something that is this way, this way. So now both B cells are going to bind with a different kind of an antigen. And this is the result of somatic hypermutation. And what does that mean actually? What that means is that in the genetics of the B cell, there is a part of the variable and uh, what is that? Constant chains or heavy chains, they, there are binding regions and there is a genetic portion that gives rise to making of these binding regions. These parts are randomly mutated. This is like you take scrabbles, the tiles, and you just mix them up and they end up being different. So every time the tiles are different, they make a different word or they would give rise to something to make a different word. That is what happened. So B cell kind of, you know, change this randomly to come up with various kinds of binding sites. And that is what is called somatic hypermutation. And this does not anticipate a variant. Somatic hypermutation just anticipates a different kind of antigen. Affinity maturation, on the other hand. So let's say this is a B cell that has bound with this type of an antigen. And let's say that antigen is bound to, is on SARS-CoV-2. Now, when this B cell will be in the lymph node, in the lymph node, normally they are in the lymph node. So let's say here we have a lymph node. And this B cell is sitting here. And the daughters are formed from this B cell. Now, this is a different process of forming the daughters. This is a proliferation process. This is not stem cell giving rise to a B cell. This is a B cell making more of its type to fight this specific antigen. It cannot do this at the more types that it is making, they are going to bind to something else. So a B cell that binds to, let's say, SARS-CoV-2 should not give rise to a daughter that is going to go and bind to a streptococcus. It has to bind to SARS-CoV-2. But these new little B cell daughters that are formed, they are trained by something, a cell called follicular, follicular dendritic cell. It is different from the normal natural dendritic cell that is outside the lymph nodes. This is follicular dendritic cell. This cell's job, I always think of them as, a, as lovers. They would pick up the antigens hold them like a, a, a romantic lover will pick up a flower and then offer that flower to their beloved. Similarly, these follicular dendritic cells will pick up the antigens that are being brought in through the lymphatics and through the macrophages and other things. They would hold them up for these new daughters to train them, these daughters. So these daughters who are going to connect here, they would not just become active that, oh, we found an antigen, attack it. They're going to bind there and kind of understand how do we make a better fit. So their binding site is still the same. They are just going to, just like a wrench, you keep moving the wrench in a way that it becomes tighter and tighter and becomes better fit. That is what is happening. This is called affinity maturation. So affinity maturation would allow a daughter B cell to bind better with the pathogen of the same kind. So the idea of uh, somatic hypermutation to end up creating anticipating cells for the next generation of the virus is impossible. Randomly, they ended up making such things that is fine, but it's not a planned thing, neither with the affinity maturation nor with her somatic hypermutation, affinity maturation is a closer phenomena where the newer cells are better selected to bind with that antigen because they keep becoming refined and refined. This is what I had done a study last year talking about 
This was a Chinese study in which they said that because there is because there is a, a pathogen, because there is the SARS-CoV-2 debris still present in the GIT, GIT mucosa or GIT cells, that debris or the, the and it stays on after the symptoms for 59 days, those debris is actually helping immune system to continue to become better trained because the debris goes to the lymph nodes and the B cell become more affinity matured and they become better and better at killing the pathogen. So that is the concept of affinity maturation and somatic hypermutation. So with this, we are at 8.25. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I hope everybody stays happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> freaking American said, I was tightening my bike seat with, with a wrench just as you said that. That was affinity maturation that was happening when you were tightening it. And so all B cells and T cells, they do that, especially B cell do it with the help of the follicular dendritic cells. So uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, time to go to have dinner and go to bed. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Please like, subscribe, and share. I know it is difficult to like videos that are so long, but there are sometimes useful things in there. And if you would like to support this work, there are three links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can be a patron. $5 per month patron is great. <laughs> you can be a patron or you can use PayPal to support this work. Thank you very much. I'll see you tomorrow.